suppose I've read worse. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. So, uh, the fifth wave. It was... Well, it was pretty popular back when it first came out, and it's not hard to see why. You know, it's a little bit different from most of what was coming out before, and uh, this, this is just the first one. Now, I, I set the other two back here, don't worry. And I, you know, it was different. It was not quite all the, or not quite the same as all the dystopian crap that was coming out around that time. And it was still kind of similar, though. Like, it still had a teenage girl protagonist, it was still primarily an action-adventure story, and it still dealt with a different society than the one we have today, but... Well, that's because the society in this is completely gone. I will say right off the bat that this is probably the best example of great, great ideas. I really mean that. But with absolute dog crap execution. And I, you won't hear me say that very often just because, well, it's not really saying anything. And also, it's raining outside. I don't know if the mic picks that, that up, but, uh, and, well, I just remembered I need to talk quieter, so... Yeah, it's just, just saying that something has good ideas and bad execution really doesn't mean anything because most stories in all forms of media have good ideas and it always comes down to the execution. Like, it's very rare that something will have just bad ideas and that's why it fails. And the fifth wave is, well, I mean, more than anything, I'm just disappointed in it. And, uh, well, enough talking around the issue. This is about a teenage girl named Cassie who lives in Ohio in the United States and one day this alien ship appears basically out of nowhere and starts floating around in the sky. At first people are, you know, scared but the aliens don't really do anything to them so they're thinking, okay, we can, we can deal with this. But then uh, it hits the whole world with these a successive, bleh, a succession of attacks. There's uh, the first wave which is where it just sends out an EMP which knocks out almost all the technology throughout the world. Then there is the second wave, which is th the ships drop these giant tungsten rods onto uh, the faults in tectonic plates and it causes massive earthquakes which then cause massive tsunamis which just wipe out almost all the coastlines all over the world. Then there is the third wave, which is just a flu or not flu, uh, a virus that goes around and kills pretty much everyone that's left. When the book starts, they're in the midst of the fourth wave, which is uh, just aliens have apparently taken over human bodies, and so you don't really know who to trust anymore, and the human-alien parasite takeover hybrid, whatever you want to call them, are going around killing folks. And as the title oh so subtly implies, this one starts off right before the fifth wave really gets going. Now, I will say that even though I didn't read this back when it first came out, I kind of wanted to because the covers for it are really solid. The marketing for it is really solid. The titles are attention grabbing and I just never got around to it. And it was only over uh, the next couple of years that I kept hearing about it that I thought, oh, that's, that sounds like it's pretty bad. So I guess I'm not that interested anymore. So a couple months ago, I announced I was doing this after I got through, you know, Throne of Glass and House of Night and, and some other stuff. And just out of curiosity, I watched the movie and it was really bad. I guess it wasn't the worst thing I've ever seen, but I mean, really all I liked about it was the first 20 minutes where it's just showing the world get destroyed. Those are pretty solid. And Chloe Grace Moretz's performance as Cassie is also pretty solid. Other than that, it's just, it's just crap. So, I knew, basically, I knew the story of the first book, at least in broad strokes, because there are a couple of changes from book to film. But after that, I was going in totally blind. And, well, shit, there's, there's no more talking around it. Let's just get right in here. Now, the book starts with a prologue, which sounds fine at first, but, uh, well, it kind of gives away a major part of the story. Intrusion, 1995. There will be no awakening. The sleeping woman will feel nothing the next morning, only a vague sense of unease and the unshakable feeling that someone is watching her. Her anxiety will fade in less than a day and will soon be forgotten. She will not awaken, neither will her husband beside her. The shadow falling over them will not disturb their sleep. And what the shadow has come for? 
the baby within the sleeping woman, will feel nothing. The intrusion breaks no skin, violates not a single cell of her or the baby's body. It is over in less than a minute. The shadow withdraws. And that goes on for just about a page, but it's pretty clear just from the beginning that, okay, the aliens are taking over human bodies. And at first that doesn't seem like a major spoiler or anything, or like it gives away anything, but people who have read the book or seen the movie know that later on a character enters the stage who well, is pretending to be human, so the readers from the beginning know that he's not, and that he's lying. You just gave away a decent, what could have been a decent twist, 200 pages before it actually happened. And that's not the only time this book does this. But, you know what, whatever. After this, it goes to part one of the book, and part one follows Cassie's POV, because this book is split into like, uh, ten different parts, I think, and every time it enters a new part, it switches to a different POV. It switches uh, from first person to other characters in first person to third person, and... Well, it's, it's kind of clunky, but I'll get more into that later. The first line of the book where you introduce the main character and really get a chance to show off her personality and show her shine, that's very important, obviously. So... How does this book introduce Cassie? Aliens are stupid. I'm not talking about real aliens. The others aren't stupid. The others are so far ahead of us, it's like comparing the dumbest human to the smartest dog. No contest. No, I'm talking about the aliens inside our own heads. The ones we made up. The ones we've been making up since we realized those glittering lights in the sky were suns like ours and probably had planets like ours spinning around them. You know, the aliens we imagine. The kind of aliens we'd like to attack us. Human aliens. You've seen them a million times. They swoop down from the sky in their flying saucers to level New York and Tokyo and London or they march across the countryside in huge machines that look like mechanical spiders, ray guns blasting away, and always, always, humanity sets aside its differences and bands together to defeat the alien horde. David slays Goliath, and everybody, except Goliath, goes home happy. What crap. So, right after that, Cassie, uh, it's revealed, is hiding out in the woods uh, after the world has already kind of been destroyed, and she goes searching for food and water, in an abandoned convenience store. And while she's there, she finds this guy who's dressed as uh, a soldier, and she he's asking for help. He's wounded, at least he says he's wounded, and he has his hand uh, under his jacket, clutching at his stomach. Oh, it's not really in frame, but, you know, under his jacket, clutching at his stomach. And she tells him, show me your hand, show me your hand, and she has a gun on him, and he starts pulling it out and she sees a little glint of metal and she thinks he's pulling out a gun, she shoots him, and then afterwards she sees it's a cross. Now, this is a good moment, and actually, in the movie, I think it's a pretty great moment, mostly because of Chloe Grace Moretz, Moretz's acting. She really... I'm surprised she's not hunched over from carrying that entire film on her back, really. But, here's the thing. In the book, it just started off with that, uh, like, tongue-in-cheek, silly, description of the aliens meant to show off Cassie's personality and how, oh, I'm so quirky and funny and amazing. Sorry, it's like 90 degrees in here and I was just trying on all those hats, so I'm really hot right now. But when you start off with a joke like Cassie where, oh, aliens are so dumb, these ones are super serious, it feels like, okay, the story's going to be somewhat lighthearted and not all that serious, and then it immediately goes into, oh, okay, I just murdered an innocent person, and everyone I know and love is already dead. They don't really fit together that well. What makes it even worse than that is that it kind of keeps cutting back and forth between uh, Cassie in the store with the soldier and flashbacks to her life before. And it cuts back and forth between this and her remembering when the alien ship first came and uh, recalling some of the waves. and. Then back and forth and back and forth, and so the structure of it is just confusing, and I mean, even if you set that aside, this is just incredibly overwritten. Like, at one point it spends a page and a half describing Cassie's backpack and its contents, but even worse than that is, j just here's the scene where Cassie shoots the guy. 
The stunted light kissed his bloody hand and flicked along the length of something long and thin and metallic, and my finger pulled back on the trigger, and the rifle kicked against my shoulder hard, and the barrel bucked in my hand as I emptied the clip, and from a great distance I heard someone screaming. But it wasn't him screaming, it was me screaming. Me and everyone else who was left, if there was anybody left. All of us helpless, hopeless, stupid humans screaming because we got it wrong. We got it all wrong. There was no alien swarm descending from the sky in their flying saucers or big metal walkers like something out of Star Wars, or cute little wrinkly ETs who wanted to go pluck a couple of leaves, eat some Reese's Pieces, and go home. That's not how it ends. That was all one sentence, by the way. And it it's only describing, I saw a glint of metal in his hand, I pulled the trigger, and shot him. You could do so much more with so much less. Like, it, it could have been a pretty impactful scene if it had been, like, quick and simple. Which, I'm, I'm not gonna try and compare this to the movie too much, but honestly, as bad as the movie is, it does a lot of things better than the book does. Not everything, but a lot of things. And in that case, it was very quick and to the point. Which, granted, it can be a little quicker just because it's a visual medium, but nonetheless, all it does is show the guy, see the gun to metal, shoot, and then see, oh, it's a cross, oh shit, and, like, you get the picture. So, yeah, then we go back to flashbacks in earnest, right? And at this point, it stays in flashback mode for a while, which is good, because flopping back and forth more than that is really annoying. And when Cassie is describing how the other ship uh, first arrives, I did like that. There's a decent, like, sense of dread about what's gonna happen, who is this gonna hurt, who's this gonna kill. And it's even worse because you already have seen ahead and you know, oh shit, things are, things are gonna get bad. So, like I said, uh, Cassie describes the various waves in succession. The first wave, where all the technology gets wiped out, and she describes how a plane crashed nearby when the, te when the EMP went off, and I, I mean, I don't think that's how it would work. I think if a plane already had forward momentum, it would just glide for a while before it crashed, but whatever. Uh, and then there's the second wave, which sh is earthquakes, and then third wave, and the fourth, yada yada. And so, while it's doing this, it does still cut back and forth a little bit, but just not as much as it was before. And uh, Cassie is going around by the highway, and she gets shot by a sniper. And we know, or at least we assume at this point, that it is an alien possessing a human body. Cassie hides under a car, and then eventually, at the end of all the flashbacks and everything, she comes out, but let's focus on the flashbacks for now. So, like I said, she was a pretty normal girl. She had a crush on this dude named Ben, who is not actually shown at this beginning part, but he becomes important later. Uh, and the way they decide to show that she has a crush on Ben is to show her going on a date with another dude after the ship arrives and them not really having any chemistry, which is... I mean, it's a very awkward scene, but it's also awkward on purpose, so I guess I can't fault it too much. But, you know, average, normal girl lived with her mom, her dad, and her five-year-old brother named Sammy, and after the first two waves, you know, shit is getting real, and they're, you know, gathering up supplies and all that, and then in the third wave, her mom dies. She dies of the virus. But, uh, her, her dad, and her brother are presumably immune because they just don't get sick. Uh, there are a couple of people who get sick and get better, but most of the time if you get sick, you're, you're... just start counting down from there. So after her mom dies, her, her dad, and her brother head out to a refugee camp, and... I feel like this scene went on too long. Okay, we get it. It's a bunch of ramshackle huts put together, people are banding together, gathering up weapons just to protect themselves, and staying away from the aliens or human bandits or whatever. That makes sense, but it spends like 20 or 30 pages on that, and it just... It, it, you really don't need to. Now, at this point, the book isn't, uh... Well, it's not bad, per se, but the structure is horrible. Like, uh, I kind of described Throne of Glass the same way, where you have a bunch of pieces of a good story there, like, all these pieces individually are fine, but the way they're assembled just, it does not work very well at all. There's also a really awkward bit where there's a 13-year-old boy there, and Cassie, who is 16, 
uh, has to keep putting off his advances. Like, he keeps saying, hey, are you a virgin? Because I'll have sex with you, and it's just... It's just kind of unpleasant. So anyways, after they're at uh, the refugee camp for a while, uh, the military shows up. They're from uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, which I looked it up, that is a real base. And they're led by a guy named Lieutenant Colonel Vosh, who is played by Leo Schreiber in the movie, which admittedly, he's great, but he doesn't really do anything in the first book, or the first film for that matter. Uh, but still, it was nice to imagine him playing this as I was watching this, so, you know, it could be better. But anyways, the military shows up, and they say, hey, we're here to help, we're here to get you out of here because we think this camp is going to get attacked. So they brought, on, they brought in some vehicles which were either shielded or repaired from the EMP, and at first they say, okay, we, can only, we only have enough room to take the kids uh, under the age of 15 or 16. And so Sammy has to go off by himself, and Cassie and her dad stay behind. Now, this is one of the things that the book actually did better than the movie. Because in the movie, it's just Cassie stepped off the bus for a minute, and then it goes off without her, so we have this really cheesy scene of her running after it with her hand out, like, no, don't. Stop! Sue! Cassie! Wait, stop! Sue, no! Sue, wait! Sue! Cassie! Whereas in this, it's just, yeah, we don't have room for you, so wait here, we'll come back. So all the remaining people, the military, tells them to gather up because they have announcements to make and all that. And uh, when they're all gathered up, Cassie notices that the 13-year-old kid who was hitting on her is gone. And so she's like, oh, hey, where'd he go? And Colonel Vosh tells another soldier, like, hey, go with her, find that kid. We need everybody here. And so he goes off with her, and he's actually in front of Cassie most of the time. And as soon as they get to the latrine where the kid's hanging out, or not the latrine, the, uh, the ash pit where they have all the dead bodies burned, uh, the soldier just immediately shoots the kid with his back turned to Cassie, remember? And then she, in a haste, just pulls out a gun that she had and shoots him. This is a really, 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 really dumb moment. You don't turn your back on someone if you're going to kill them. And as this is going on, Cassie hears a bunch of other gunshots from back at the camp, and so she runs up, and uh, she doesn't go right into it, she's still hiding back in the woods, but she runs up, she sees her dad is shot, and he's crawling away, but before she can go to him, he looks at her and just goes, no, don't, and then uh, Colonel Bosch comes right up and shoots him in the head, kills him. And once all the adults are dead, the military people bring out this uh, weird futuristic looking bomb, which they call the Eye, and it's pretty clear from the beginning that, oh, this is alien technology, and so we, the audience, immediately know, oh shit, okay, these soldiers are controlled by aliens. Which is, I mean, I mean, it's, <laughs> it would be better if I didn't already know it, but anyways, they uh, set off the bomb, and Cassie, in order to escape, hides among the dead bodies, and it's the first action scene, but it's also, like, over in a page, so, you know, nothing to write home about. So Cassie is on her own, her dad is dead, her mom is dead, her brother is missing somewhere. And this is another area where the movie handled it a lot better than the book did, because the movie, it's made pretty clear right away, Cassie just says in her narration, okay, my brother is at Wright-Patterson, he's with the aliens, I don't know what's being done to him, but I gotta go save him, so she immediately sets off to go and find him. And then uh, that's when she uh, ran into the convenience store and found the soldier dude who was innocent that she accidentally killed. In the book, she says that she wants to go after Sammy, but then she also mentions that she's camped out in the woods in the same spot for several weeks. So, um, oh, okay, I feel like those are contradictory. Like, that's something an editor should have gotten. Like, he should have said, hey, you mentioned at a couple of points that she's been hiding out in the woods for weeks. Would, wouldn't it make more sense to just have her be hiking through the woods when she runs into that dude and then later runs into the sniper? W wouldn't that make more sense? Hello? Anyone? So, by that point, it catches up to the present, where Cassie is still hiding under the car where she was shot by the sniper. And as a brief aside, at one point she mentions that... Uh, he must have a high-powered sniper rifle. She got shot in the leg, by the way. And at one point she mentions that he must be having a high-powered sniper rifle, and I'm just thinking, 
girl, if you had a high-powered sniper rifle, you wouldn't have a leg anymore. But, you know, whatever, not a big deal in the grand scheme of things. But, you know, it ends with her popping out of the car and running off. And then it cuts to part two, Wonderland, and it cuts to a different character's first-person POV. Now, having watched the movie, I already knew that this was Ben, the girl that she had a crush on, but in the book, I realized about halfway through this first uh, chapter of this part, where it's in Ben's POV, I realized that it hadn't told us what his name was yet. <laughs> so this was just some dude. You know, we, we didn't know it was Ben, we didn't know it was someone Cassie knew, it was just some guy who has the plague and is hiding in a refugee camp not far outside of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and uh, he later gets better from the plague. Maybe you could have done something with that, where maybe at the end of a chapter it's like, oh, by the way, Ben, and you're like, oh, okay, it's that guy, but like I said, he's literally never shown up in the book before this point. So w when, when you realize it's Ben, it's more of an, oh, really now? That's, um, okay, that changes nothing. But what's even worse than this is that uh, this part uh, is pretty long, and it's just Ben's POV for a while. And it, so it takes us away from Cassie's story, which was just starting to get kind of exciting. Like, imagine if one-fourth of the way through Harry Potter, like, just as he's arriving at Hogwarts, it suddenly switches to Dudley's POV, and then it's about his adventures. And, you know, maybe Dudley's adventures are great, but it's not what we were invested in before. So it's just really clumsy. This is what I mean when I say it has horrible structure and all the pieces are not put together well. It's just horribly clumsy. So anyways, Ben, uh, through some clumsy exposition, explains that his whole family is also dead. Uh, they were killed by some human marauders who came to their house. Uh, they killed his mom, his dad, and his younger sister, who coincidentally is around the same age as Sammy. And, I mean, this is kind of a good uh, character bit, like where he feels like he failed because he ran away and he wasn't able to protect people that were depending on him, but at the same time, that's kind of all that is to, there is to Ben's character. Like, he really never evolves past that. And as annoying as Cassie's uh, over-the-top quirkiness got, gets at some points when it's from her POV, Ben's POV has no personality whatsoever. So Ben, after he's uh, all healed up from the plague, um, he hears some uh, fighting inside Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and then the soldiers come out to the refugee camp and they start saying, hey guys, come, come on with us, come on in. And uh, the people inside there, they tell them, that this is pretty clearly a lie, but they tell them, oh, uh, some other soldiers were controlled by the aliens, which they're called the Others in this, which is just really lazy. Like, just come up with a name, dude. It doesn't have to be a good name, but something that isn't just a noun with a capitalized first letter. So Ben gets basically conscripted as a soldier, which makes sense because they're facing a massive manpower shortage. They, they mentioned not long after this that 6.98 billion people have died, which means there's about 20 million left in the entire world. So, okay, that bit makes sense. And then they... That I, I feel like this could be good, but like, because we, the audience, already know that, okay, yes, these guys are aliens, these guys are others, it doesn't really mean much. So basically, Ben gets a tracker put in him, and they conscript him, and there's like a bunch of big signs saying foreshadowing and stuff like that. And then they have a computer program called uh, Wonderland, which they tell them that, it, oh, it's a program that we got from the others, but I feel like that would be a hardware issue rather than a software issue. And a anyways, it just reads all his memories and... Cool. Another weird bit is that Colonel Vosh, like, personally goes up to Ben and asks him to join up, and I'm just thinking, shouldn't someone lower ranking be doing that? Um, okay. And, again, it tries to make Vosh seem like a friendly dude, like, yeah, he's on his side, but we, the audience, already know that he's an alien at this point. And uh, later on in the book, it's treated as like a big twist when uh, Ben realizes, oh shit, I've been working with the aliens this whole time. 
but we, the audience, know that. It, it's given away, like, over 200 pages before it comes, so it, that's not even a twist at that point. Basically, Ben's part ends with, oh, okay, I'm gonna start training. And then we get to part three, which is from the sniper's POV, sort of. It, it's in third-person POV, which, as an aside, I just really hate when they switch between thirst, first and third-person POV. Like, it's very clumsy. Like, here's the thing. It's mentioned that Cassie has a journal at multiple points, and so at first when I was reading, I just thought, oh, okay, like, this is her journal, you know? Like, uh, obviously it has more detail and everything that than a real journal would have, but, you know, you sort of suspend your disbelief for that sort of thing. Like, uh, the Cirque de Freak series, for example, was done using this uh, narrative idea. I'm not, I'm not sure what the... Uh, this framing device, let's call it. Uh, and it worked out fine. It just was mentioned at a few points that Darren writes in a journal, and it's all from his first-person perspective, so we know, okay, the series is from his perspective. Uh, another kind of similar example is in the King Killer Chronicles. It's just Kavoth telling the story to somebody else. So when it's all in first-person, we know, okay, he's just talking like this. And... You can suspend your disbelief for that. You know that it wouldn't actually have this much detail in real life, but you, you can just, you can get over it. It's fine. But when you switch, not only between multiple characters, but between first and third person, it just makes you question it. Like, you're not supposed to question it, but doing that forces you to do that. So anyways, the sniper, who shot Cassie, um, has apparently been stalking her for a while and reading her journal, so, like, he knows about who she is, and all about her life and everything that's led her up to this point, and apparently he loves her as well, which is, um, okay. And so we get his entire backstory all at once, and his name is Evan, by the way, it's not really a spoiler because you find that out not long after this, but yes, his name is Evan Walker, and apparently he was a normal kid for like 13 or 14 years, and then his programming uh, kicked in one day, and he realized, oh, I'm an alien inside a human body. Um, okay, sure. And now he's, like, working with the, with the others and killing people the way he's supposed to, but he's having pains of conscience, and, well, we already understand him, and we know that he genuinely does care for Cassie, so when he uh, tracks her down where she's uh, fallen in the snow and then brings her back home and patches up her leg and everything... There's no tension when maybe there should be. Even if Cassie is scared of him, we, the audience, know he's fine. You know, he, he's not going to hurt her or anything. And this is another thing that the movie did better. It showed, uh, it, it didn't give us Evan's inner thoughts. It just showed Cassie waking up there and she doesn't know, can I trust this guy or anything? So then we cut back to Cassie and she wakes up in his house with her leg patched up and she's kind of horny over him, because what's more romantic than being shot, am I right? And I feel the need to bring up here, th this isn't the only time it happens in this book at all, but in fact it happened before this and it happens a bunch of times after, but it seems to have a very Hollywood idea of atheism, where people only stop believing in God because of tragedies in their life, and they're just like, oh, God did bad things, therefore I don't believe anymore, and I'm just... Th that's not how it works most of the time, guys. Like, that's still believing in God, you're just angry with him because you think he did something bad to you. Most of the time, atheism is just, oh, I don't believe in God. You know, I looked, I looked at the facts and everything and it just, it, it doesn't convince me. That, that's how it usually works. So, we, we just go through this whole uh, rigmarole where Cassie is being rehabilitated because, you know, you can't just patch up your leg after it's been shot. You gotta do some physical rehabilitation to work back up to where you were before. And, well, that's the main thing that happens in this part of the book. Like, Evan and her argue a little bit, but, well, that, that's about all. Although there is one really cringy sex scene. Let's read it. He lifts me into his arms. I seem to float upward forever. Like when I was a little girl and Daddy flung me into the air, feeling as if I'd just keep going up until I reach the edge of the galaxy. He lays me on the bed. I say, right before he kisses me again, If you kiss me again, I'm going to knee you in the balls. His hands are incredibly soft, like a cloud touching me. I won't let you. Just, he searches for the right word. Fly away from me, Cassie Sullivan. 
He blows out the candle beside the bed. I feel his kiss more intensely now, in the darkness of the room where his sister died, in the quiet of the house where his family died, in the stillness of the world where the life we knew before the arrival died. He tastes my te tears before I can feel them, where there would be tears, his kiss. I didn't save you, he whispers, lips tickling my eyelashes. You saved me. He repeats it over and over until we fall asleep pressed against each other, his voice in my ear, my tears in his mouth. You saved me. At first, when I read that, I was like, not even sure if they had sex, which is a common thing in young adults. Like, y you can just say someone had sex. Like, you don't have to get into graphic description of it. But when you're so flowery with the language like that, it's, it just becomes confusing. And uh, also, again, what's even more romantic than being shot? Being in a room where someone's family died and actively thinking about that while you make out with them and while they suck on your eyeball. So then we have a way too long part where, like I said, it switches to a different part every time it goes to a new perspective. It really didn't need to do that. Like, if this book had just been in third person the whole way, which I really think it should have been, uh, then it could just switch to different characters now and again and it wouldn't be confusing. You wouldn't really think about it. But anyways, we get 25 pages uh, following Sammy where it's third person present tense and it's kind of confusing because I don't like third person present tense. It just feels awkward, but that's just me. Some other people can get over that. And anyways, he's recruited as a soldier, which is, it, it, um, okay. He's like five years old. I'm not sure what he's going to do. And I know child soldiers are a thing. Don't get me wrong. It's just that the military conscripting people who are like 15, 16, 17, I totally buy because in this, they actually do full on train them to do stuff. They don't just give him a gun and say, yeah, go, go fight, which is how child soldier training usually goes. With Sammy, he's, again, he's five. He's too small to carry most of their equipment, for starters, or to use it properly. And he's not mentally or emotionally developed enough to properly, well, properly learn anything. Like, it's mentioned at a couple of points later that he doesn't even remember how to read. So, how are you going to train him to do all this? And they also... Uh, mix kids up by age. Like, they don't just have a bunch of 15-year-olds uh, working in one unit together. They have, like, 17-year-olds like Ben working with 5-year-olds like uh, Sammy, and then they have kids in, all in the middle, too. Like, you really think a 5-year-old is going to be able to keep up with the rest? So anyways, uh, yeah, Sammy is assigned to Ben's unit, Ben is the sergeant, and they just go through a whole bunch of training. Uh, the instructor... Man, the instructor in this is really stupid because it feels like, it genuinely does feel like Rick Yancey just watched Full Metal Jacket and saw the, uh, all the, yeah, what was the word, boot camp scenes. He saw all those and he just thought, oh, okay, drill instructors are supposed to horribly abuse people and the more they abuse them, the better soldiers, the tougher soldiers they'll be. And that's not how it works at all. The idea is to break them down and then build them back up so that they just will follow your orders all the time. And, you know, obviously there's some other stuff in there, like teaching them how to shoot and stuff, but this drill instructor is, like, actually physically abusive. Like, he will hit them and will scream at little kids who, I just want to mention again, they are not emotionally and mentally developed enough to handle that. Like, hell, a lot of adults can't even handle that. That's why people wash out of basic training. But if you're 18, 19 joining the military, you can you understand that, okay, this is nothing personal, he's just training me to be better. Whereas if you're a kid, you're gonna think, oh, okay, he's just being mean to me. You're, it's not gonna work well. So anyways, they introduce another character named Ringer to the team, and she's a girl who is... She's described as Asian in the book. She's very blatantly not Asian in the movie, but, you know, let's, uh, let's not open that can of worms. And anyways, she's like super hashtag edgy, super hashtag badass, and she helps their team uh, climb up in the rankings because all the different units are ranked based on their performance. And it's mentioned that apparently only high-ranking teams graduate, which is... Um... That, that's really dumb. Like, okay, it makes sense if you're talking about, like, an elite cadre of soldiers. Like, if you want the absolute best of the best, then you could do something like that. You take all the different uh, groups of soldiers that volunteered to try and be the best of the best, 
and you can say, oh, okay, only the top four are going to make it through here, so do your best, and then they'd compete against each other, and it would probably help them. Whereas, these kids are supposed to be normal soldiers. Like, as long as they can complete the training, what does it matter if they did better or worse? Like, if they really weren't fit to be soldiers, they wouldn't complete the training at all. God, I am... There, there is so much... This is, this is so much... God, I hate it. So anyways, after they complete their training, uh, Vosh comes up to Ben, who, remember, is the sergeant, and he basically tells him, Hey, we captured someone who has an alien in their head, and we read their mind using the Wonderland, and there's gonna be a bunch of them over in Dayton, which, if you don't know, that's a city in Ohio, and, uh, so Ben is thinking, Okay, yeah, we're gonna go kill some aliens. And then it cuts to Cassie. So... Yeah, every time it starts to get exciting, it just cuts away to another character. So Cassie is still with Evan, still on his uh, farm, still uh, getting better from being shot in the leg. Which, remember, Evan did that to her. <laughs> God, that's so stupid. I mean, the one good thing I can say about her and Evan's relationship is that he's age-appropriate for her, which is surprisingly uncommon in young adult stuff, but, uh, you know, whatever. And... Cassie, at one point, is starting to get suspicious of him, which, again, there's no tension there because the audience already knows that, one, Evan is an alien, and two, he means her no harm. He really is on her side, because we got to be inside his head and look through his perspective. You, you can't... Like, you could have easily just cut out that chapter and... whatever. So Cassie just eventually decides to trust him, even though she finds her gun that she dropped by the car in his barn, and she thinks, how could he have gotten this? And he's just like, oh, um, I, I, uh, I, 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 I found it, and she, she believes him. Basically, there's enough content for one chapter, but it goes on and on and on for way too long. So Ben and his squad go on a mission, minus Sammy, because he, he's just too young, you know, that, which makes sense, you know, he's, like, five years old, but at the same time, they're sending in kids that are, like, eight, so... <sighs> Never mind. So, they have these, uh, magical, uh, eyepiece things, which, when they look through them, they can see whether someone is infected by an alien or not. Uh, it glows green. And, uh, things go bad while they're on the mission. They wind up cornered, uh, they get shot at a bunch, and, uh, Ringer, uh, in because she's suspicious, she cuts the tracker that they implanted in her out of her neck, and then her head lights up through the eyepiece, so they realize, oh, okay, this isn't actually telling us who's an alien, it's telling us who isn't wearing these trackers. These people are just humans. And then she literally just says, we're the fifth wave! Which is stupid, but the thing is, like I said, this isn't a twist because it was given away 200 pages ago, and for that matter, if they're already going to use human soldiers, and they already have people that are high up in the military, why didn't they just turn countries against each other before the invasion even happened? Like, wouldn't that soften them up? Already kill a bunch of people? Uh, strain the infrastructure? Break down society a little bit? Couldn't that... No? Alright. So then their uh, drill instructor shows up, and they kill him, and he has this uh, little switch with him, and uh, Ben and Ringer go to the others, and they tell them what's going on, and they tell him, hey, uh, we think this button's a kill switch. If, if we push it, it's going to set off the tracker, so we need to cut those off. And then there's one kid that doesn't believe him, so he pushes the button and kills himself. And I guess this is supposed to be serious, but honestly, I just started laughing hysterically imagining that. So, they know that they can't stay anymore, but Sam is also still back at the base, so Ben decides, okay, you know what, uh, we're gonna, I'm just gonna go back, I'm gonna tell all of them that you guys were all killed, and I'm the only one left, and then I'm gonna grab Sammy, and we're gonna go. Then we cut back to Cass and Evan again, and they agree to leave, um, his house, and then he apparently is lurking outside her room while she sleeps, which is, again, creepy, and... Like all young adult books that start a female protagonist, at this time, Cassie has a hair-cutting scene where she metaphorically gives up her childhood and grows into a new person. Cool. Anyways, she goes back to the refugee camp uh, where her father was and where everybody died so that she can pick up the trail of where Sammy went, but... 
They literally told you where they were taking him, Cassie. Are, are you that stupid? Are you that fucking stupid? So they're attacked by some soldiers who are, you know, kids, just like uh, Ben and all the rest. And Evan kills all of them because he's like a superhuman. And that's the thing about the uh, people that have the aliens inside them. It's not, they're not just mentally different, they're also physically crazy over the top. They have crazy reflexes, super strength, uh, they heal really fast, that sort of thing. And uh, so Cass finally realizes, or Cassie, excuse me, finally realizes that, oh, he's an alien, and he admits the truth with no detail, okay? He admits that he shot her, but he doesn't say anything else. He doesn't tell her about what's going on. He doesn't tell her about how, hey, I, I just had this in my head ever since I was born, but I don't want to be that way anymore. I, I, I care about you. I want to protect you. He just says, yeah, I'm an alien, and then Cass leaves, and then he chases her down, and he won't let her leave. Cool. One small dumb thing that I want to mention is that every time in this series when they're describing aliens being put into someone's head, uh, it's not really a physical thing. You know, it's not like a physical little leech or slug or anything that went inside their brain. It's just like they uploaded a program into it, which is kind of cool. And actually, Evan mentions that the aliens, the others, no longer have bodies. They uh, uploaded all their consciousnesses into a mainframe, which is on their uh, mothership up in the orbiting Earth. And, okay, that sounds cool and all, but um, they, they refer to it as downloading a program onto their brains, and it's uploading, guys. When, you, when you're sending information to someone else, it's uploading. God, this is, this is so long. Okay, so Cassie infiltrates the base by just uh, pretending to be a kid who's uh, running around by herself, and uh, they think that she is younger than she actually is. She mentions that she's pretty... Uh, oh, she mentions that she looks younger than 16 to begin with, and she also mentions that with her haircut she could pass for 12, and she tells them that she's 12 and they believe her. Now, I don't want to read too much into this, but that's also kind of the point of this... well, of this long-ass in-depth review. If she looks 12 years old, and Evan is attracted to her, what does that say about Evan? So then it goes back to Ben, who is uh, in the at, at, at the base in the hospital, uh, and he's also trying to get Sammy out, while at the same time Cassie is trying to get Sammy out. And I should mention that as this is going on, Cassie uh, is constantly remembering instructions that Evan gave her, because apparently he already knows how to infiltrate, and he already knows most of what's going on, so he literally just gave her an instruction guidebook, and. For the most part, she just follows that to the letter, and that's what gets her out. So, Cassie really doesn't have any agency in this bit, even though she's the main character, and even though she's doing stuff, she's just doing what she's being told to do, so it's not that interesting. And this is another thing that the movie did well, because at this point, she had just broken off from Evan, and he had actually stayed away from her, and she managed to infiltrate and do all this by herself. And you can say maybe it's unrealistic that she's able to do all that, sure, I, I wouldn't uh, doubt it, but at least the main character had agency and was doing stuff. So Cassie finds Sam and Ben, and she looks at them, she's like, Wow, Ben, I, I don't remember that, but uh, okay, cool, whatever. And Sammy, and she's like, Oh, I've missed you, and they hug and have a little reunion. And then Vosh starts destroying the base. Um, why? It, it, Evan makes it sound like if he thinks that it's going to be uh, captured or something, then he would have a self-destruct ready to go, which would make sense, but if it's literally just a couple of prisoners escaping, it, that feels like throwing your car out with the bathwater. And then they're recaptured, and Vosh gives a villain monologue, and he mentions how, haha, I was always watching you because, I don't know, we have to have him do something in this fucking book. And Evan then shows up, and apparently he hacks into the mainframe. Uh, Alright, because he's a hacker now, whatever. Uh, and then they manage to escape, they meet up with the Ringer and the rest of the squad, and then the base blows up. And that's the end of the first book. Now, it's bad, but it's far from the worst thing I've ever read. And it does have potential, especially at the beginning. Like, I like the idea of an apocalypse in progress, you know, we don't see a whole lot of those. Uh, at least, we don't see a whole lot of those that are anything other than zombie. 
uh, and you know, bringing up these aliens who are like so far beyond us that they can do all this crazy shit and you know cause earthquakes and break out all our technology uh, without even trying. They make for an intimidating force. Like they're not even really a villain; they're a force of nature. Yeah, there, there's just it never really does much with that. The climax is okay, I will say. While they're going through the base and all that, that's okay. It's not great, but it works. And um, I guess the waves are cool, but really this story, uh, again, just like Throne of Glass, is a simple story that's trying to be told in a complex way, and as a result it winds up being a muddled mess. Like I said, this should have been just third person, so you're not going back and forth and being confusing. And it also should have just focused on Cassie. Because here, here's the thing, her storyline gives away the big twist moment of Ben's storyline, and we know that he's okay, so there's not really any tension about something bad gonna happen to him, is, is something bad gonna happen to Sammy? There, there's none of that there. So, I think if they had just focused on Cassie, and just focused on her journey going from uh, the refugee camp to Wright Patterson, which is, it is pretty far away, I think she mentions it's over a hundred miles or something? I, I actually don't remember and I can't be bothered to check, but she, it, it would take her a while to get there, and she's going through very dangerous terrain, so the book could have just focused on her going through that, and uh, maybe occasionally cut back to Ben and Sammy, and you see that they're going through all this training and everything, and you know, like, oh shit, those are the aliens, something bad's gonna happen. Like, there could be little bits of tension in just a couple of chapters, but trying to spread it throughout, it just doesn't work. And, plus, if you just cut out the prologue and uh, cut out a few other bits, then you wouldn't be giving away twists hundreds of pages before they happened. Because that's the thing. Dramatic irony, it, that's when uh, the audience knows something that the characters don't, that can be used effectively. Uh, it can be used very effectively. Like, if uh, we, the audience, and Cassie saw the soldiers uh, kill everybody at the refugee camp, and we know, oh, those are aliens, and then we see them training Ben and Sammy, then we would know, oh, they're working for aliens, and it would be kind of tense. It's horribly, ugh, it's horribly structured. That's the end of book one. Let's just go on. So now we move on to book two, which is The Infinite Sea. And I just want to say that this book is the shortest out of all of them. Like, the fifth wave is around 450 pages, uh, the last book is around 340. This one is 300 pages exactly, and it still took me the longest to get through. Like, the other two books I read in two days each, this one took me almost a week. So, we have a prologue where some unnamed strangers, uh, who are also survivors of all this, uh, they, they die, and it's really super sad and stuff. And then we cut to Ringer's POV, which is, you know, great. Another one. Another first-person POV to keep track of. Another reason that I wish this just focused on Cassie is that she has a little bit of actual personality in her narration and stuff. And granted, it lays it on thick at times. But uh, after the beginning of the first book, it's not quite as bad after that. And Ringer and Ben have very little. So they're hiding out in this hotel and winter is coming and uh, Ringer is out on patrol and she thinks about how she loves Ben because there must be romance, obviously. And then uh, one of the other soldiers, a kid named Teacup, is out there and uh, she accidentally shoots her and she realizes, oh, okay, um, this is bad. Well, I should run off to the aliens because they can help her and my friends can't. If you wanted to have Ringer get captured, then just have her get captured. Like, m having her accidentally shoot someone just makes her look like kind of a dumbass. So then we cut to Cassie and all the rest, and Cassie tells Sammy that uh, their dad is dead, and I thought this was an okay scene. Not great, but it's okay. Uh, and she also hates Ringer because I guess women are catty. I guess, which really sums up the emptiness of her relationship with Evan. It, it really does, because she, she hates Ringer mostly just because uh, she gets attention from Ben. And Cassie, you know, she had a crush on Ben for many years before the story starts, and so she feels like, oh, I own him or something, and it just... It's, it's dumb. It makes it seem like she doesn't actually 
love Evan, even though that's supposed to be one of the uh, emotional cores of this story. By this point, I had been wondering, actually since pretty early on in the book, or the first book, why the aliens hadn't uh, utilized more effective ways of killing all the humans. Like, maybe they could have made an even better virus, or uh, it makes sense that they wouldn't just uh, use nuclear weapons or anything because that would uh, damage the planet, and presumably at this point they wanted to colonize it. At least that's what I was assuming, because we don't really get much explanation uh, before this. And it's mentioned by Evan that apparently they want to destroy humanity's humanity. Um... Okay, sure. It, it, and Evan also apparently loved Cassie before he met her because he was stalking her. And Evan runs into another uh, silencer, which is another alien with a human in, or a human with an alien in their head. Uh, her name is Grace, and they've actually known each other since before the arrival. And apparently, the silencer's purpose was just to herd humans into specific killing grounds like uh, Wright Patterson. And if the silencer was supposed to do that, then why would they bother using kid soldiers at all? Like, um, and for that matter, why have they? bothered killing most of the humans this way. Like, if they can just download themselves into human head, upload, upload themselves into human heads, they could just put a few million of themselves into strategically placed humans, and then they could take over all the world's major countries and just control the planet without a shot being fired. So Evan uh, runs away from Grace uh, because she figures out that he's no longer on her side. Uh, she shoots him, but he lives and he gets sort of cut off from the mothership, so he's no longer able to access or communicate with the other aliens. Uh, and then he finds the hotel where Cassie and company are staying, and he decides to sneak in. Why would you sneak in, dude? Like, th these are friendlies. Just come out and with, like, your hands up and say, Guys, it's me, it's Evan. I helped you escape from the base, remember? And then they could... You know, I, I get that you're afraid that they'll just shoot you without asking questions, but Cassie is there. She can she can vouch for you. So after he sneaks in, he winds up fighting some people, which again could have been avoided. And then just out of nowhere, it cuts to uh, a kid named Poundcake. Now Poundcake is one of the kids in the squad, and we get um, this, well, we just get his whole backstory over the course of a chapter, which is, okay, admittedly in a vacuum, this is really good. It's a heartbreaking, dark backstory. Because uh, basically, he's eight years old, he had a three-year-old brother, his dad died really early on, and then his mom got sick, and he was trying to take care of her and his brother at the same time, but they were just running out of food at their house, and he couldn't go out because, you know, there's bandits and stuff, it's dangerous. And eventually, he is forced to go back out, and he comes back, his brother is gone, and then his mom dies not long after that, and then he's on his own, He wanders off and eventually he uh, finds the others and they recruit him. And that's a really sad story, it's really depressing, it's dark as hell, and well, we get the feeling that this is a major tragedy because it's happened to literally millions of other people who are still alive. So yeah, this is good in a vacuum, but at the same time Poundcake is a tertiary character at best who has done nothing in the story so far. Like, it's not even just that I haven't mentioned him, it's that he's done nothing. This entire book is filler up to this point, by the way, and we're like a third of the way through. So they decide that, okay, we need to leave this hotel because it's dangerous, and Ringer and Teacup have just disappeared, they don't know where they are at this point, uh, but they can't move Evan because he's wounded, and they argue about it, and they argue about it, and they argue about it, and then a little girl shows up with a bomb in her throat that they have to surgically remove, and they just barely manage to do it. Here's my question. If the others know where they are in the hotel, why not just bomb the hotel? Like, they not only have access to uh, American military hardware, which can definitely do that. You know, you can launch missiles from silos, or you can just get a plane out and fire one. But they also have alien technology, which is presumably leagues beyond that. So, why not just kill them at the hotel? Oh, right, that would make sense. So Ben almost kills the little girl with the bomb in her throat before they remove it because it's like really risky, and, but he decides not to. And uh, Cassie and Ben actually share a quick kiss, but, and, and I liked this moment because it's, she kisses him, but then she realizes while she's doing it that, you know what, I don't actually like him anymore. You know, 
a year ago, she would have been super happy about that because she had a crush on him, but she realized, okay, they're, they're both different people now. They've both changed a lot. And I like that because, one, it's just a good character moment for both of them. It makes it really shows how much they have changed over the course of the story. And two, it's made clear that there's not going to be a love triangle here. Like, it felt like there was going to be a Cassie, Evan, and Ben one, and it also kind of felt like there was going to be a Cassie, Ringer, and Ben one, but with her breaking off from Ben that way, and it being confirmed, there's no longer going to be a love triangle. So whatever issues I have with this series, that's not one of them. So Grace, the other that was with Evan, comes back, and they fight her, and while they're fighting, Cassie keeps looking at her boobs and thinking about how nice her body is, and she's like, grr, I'm gonna destroy that perfect body because men writing women, am I right? So then Evan stays behind while the others flee because he's there to, like, distract Grace and all that, and then uh, while they're gone, they hear the bomb go off at the hotel. And at first we're thinking, how did that happen? But then it cuts to Pound Cake's POV. Now, during the fighting, he had been uh, shot, and they were think and at first they tried dragging him along, but then they realized, you know what, he's dead, and he's not gonna, we're not gonna be able to save him, and he's just slowing us down, so we're just gonna have to leave him. And so they do, and then it cuts to his POV, or not really his POV, but it cuts to third person where it follows him, and he actually crawls all the way back to the hotel and finds the little bomb that they uh, removed from the girl's throat and blows it up, and it destroys him, Grace, and the hotel all at once. And, I mean, I guess this means a little bit more because we got his backstory, but at the same time, he doesn't do anything up until this point, so how are we supposed to care about Pound Cake's death? So at this point, we're about two-thirds through the book, and the entire last third just follows Ringer. And, uh, that's not good because Ringer is, uh, well, one, she's just not a very interesting character, and two, there's not anything interesting happening in this last bit. Keep in mind, the last third of this is a little over a hundred pages. So she mentions that she doubts Vosh is human, which I feel like we already know he's not human, so why are we doubting that? That's, that's weird. Editors should really get that sort of thing. Uh, she plays chess with him, which is a very overdone thing because, I don't know, the villain playing chess is just a cheap way of making him seem smart and sophisticated without him having him actually do anything smart or sophisticated. Because throughout all of this, even though Vosh, I will say he has a little bit of personality, he hasn't really done anything smart to show that he's intimidating. Like, the aliens have a whole, as a whole have, because, you know, the first uh, three waves killed almost seven billion people, but Vosh himself is kind of a dumbass. Like, he hasn't been able to catch these kids, he's come up with this system where uh, he arms and trains people who, if they ever discover what's really going on, they will actively try to kill him. L like, why is he supposed to be a good villain here? So Ringer, while she's being held captive here, uh, she gets this... They call it the Twelfth System put in her, and basically what that is, is it's supposed to give her uh, the superhuman abilities that all the others that are hu aliens in human bodies Man, they are really not good at coming up with names for this. It, it makes talking about it confusing, but... Yeah, basically, they put this thing inside her body, which gives her super strength, speed, all that. Um, but she has to take some time to heal up, and she's still being held uh, prisoner. And while she's there, she's uh, hanging out with this dude named Razor. That's obviously not his real name. His real name is Alex, but Razor sounds better, so I'll use that. And uh, basically, they just hang out together while she's in prison, they play chess and stuff, and eventually they become friends, and eventually they're able to use it to send, or they're able to use chess to send messages to each other, and then, uh, Ringer is just, she's here for weeks and weeks, by the way. Like, the timelines in this book are not super well explained, but at least we know that much. And, anyways, uh, man, you're, you're gonna think I'm making this up, but... No, this next part is totally 100% real. I last for a few hours after he leaves, long after lights out in every other part of the camp, deep into the belly of the winter night before the pressure becomes unbearable, and then, when I can't take it anymore, I start shouting for help, waving at the camera, and then rolling over to press my chest against the cold metal railings, pounding my fist into the pillow in frustration and fury, until the door bursts open and Claire charges in, followed closely by a big bear of a recruit whose hand immediately flies to cover his nose. What happened? Claire says, though the smell should tell her all she needs to know. Oh crap, the recruit burbles behind his hand. Exactly, I gasp. So, 
if you couldn't pick up on that, uh, Ringer purposely shits all over herself so that they'll come in and then they bring her to the showers to clean off and then she kills the guards and escapes. Which really raises the question, why the fuck would they give powers to a prisoner? Why would they... Yeah, okay, I think we've established by this point that Vosh is not a very intelligent villain. But it's also, it also turns out that she was supposed to escape at this, because she gets a helicopter, flies away, she winds up on the other side of Lake Erie in Canada. And uh, she crashes near a warehouse, I don't know, and she runs into Vosh. He's actually there waiting for her. Now, I don't know how he knew she would come to this specific spot, but you know what, I'm already, this is already long enough, so let's not, uh, yeah, okay. The escape was a test, so aliens are, just wanted to test her abilities, even though they gave her this technology and it's already been used with a bunch of other people, so they should already know how it works and how well it works. Okay. Now, at this point we get another big twist, where Vosh reveals, and, or Ringer sort of figures it out, but I don't know, Vosh kind of just talks, he doesn't even give exposition, he just talks around exposition. Like, oh, what do you think this means? And then the heroes are like, I'm not sure. And he's like, oh, 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 oh I'm so, I'm so mysterious, cool villain. Like, I don't know. But anyways, we get the second big twist of the series, which is that aliens aren't actually in people's heads. You see, when the aliens came through here, uh, like, decades ago, and apparently they've been watching humanity for thousands of years as well, um why didn't they just come here and kill all of us when we had, like, spears and stuff? We, we couldn't fight back at all, but... Okay, n never mind. Whatever. It's, it's not a big deal. It's just... if Because if they do that, then we don't have a story. Okay, I'll buy that. But it also turns out that when the aliens were going around putting themselves into people's heads, it wasn't actually alien consciousnesses. Because, you know, they would be risking themselves. They'd be in real danger of uh, being hurt if that was the case. They actually took, like, computer programs, uploaded them into people's heads so that they think that they have aliens in their heads. Does that really make a difference at this point? No, no, I mean, for real, like, the aliens are here, and people like Vosh are on their side. Does it really matter if they're human or alien at, at this point? Like, because Vosh knows that he is actually a human with an alien program, but all the others don't. And he's still going along with it. And for that matter, why would he bother telling Ringer about it? Um, yeah, okay. So Vosh uh, then beats the crap out of Ringer. She's injured, and he leaves Razor to take care of her. Uh, Razor and Ringer have sex, and then uh, Vosh eventually returns. Ringer says aliens want to leave some humans alive. Like she said, I figured it out. You guys want to leave some humans alive. Which is, like, why? Why would they want to do that? There's really no better time to bring this up, because the aliens never really give a proper explanation for why they invade the Earth. Like, n not even kind of a little bit. Like, at first, it seems like, okay, they want to just wipe out the humans so they can colonize. Which would be, you know, that would make sense. We're a life-bearing planet, and you can just say, yeah, that's rare in the universe, and they need more space. Cool. It's not like humans haven't done similar things in the past. Like. That's a simple motivation, and we can understand it. But then Vosh, uh, through some of his monologues, brings up how, like, oh, humans have poisoned the air and the water and all that, so it seems like it's an environmental thing, and the aliens want to protect the environment, which... I, 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 I think that's what it is? I, I think? And the way that they're doing that is they wipe out most of the population, and then the remaining population, they're going to, uh, quote, change human nature, or destroy humanity's humanity, by uh, making it impossible to trust, excuse me, making it impossible to trust one another, not only by putting the silencers out there so you don't know, oh, these might be aliens uh, and they might kill me, but they also um, are going around putting, you know, bombs in little kids' throats and sending them out so that people will see a kid and go like, oh, okay, let's help this kid, and then they'll get blown up so that they'll no longer trust each other and they'll no longer have that instinct to protect children. And... By doing that, humans will never build up a proper civilization again, and the Earth can heal. Um, that's stupid. That's, that's really, really, really stupid. 
and I feel like there's so many better ways you could do that. Like, why not just infect humans with a viral plague that sterilizes most of us? Or, better yet, make it so that uh, our birth rate drops drastically. Like, uh, something like the Genophage from Mass Effect, if you ever played that, basically an alien race gets uh, infected with a genetic bomb, basically, which makes it so that uh, only one in a thousand of uh, their pregnancies actually come to term. So most of them, like, they can't grow their population anymore. Why not just do that with humans? Or they know enough about our genetics to make a virus that'll kill most of us. Why not just, you know, just just throwing that out there. You know, I'm, I'm literally just a dude who read this and came up with a better plan than these aliens did after watching us for thousands of years. Now, the reason that Vosh uh, puts the modifications into Ringer is that... Okay, so apparently Evan's uh, programming went faulty, and it, it's later revealed that it was love that made him do it, because love is just so special, and apparently none of the other silencers who... none of them ever fell in love. Okay, sure, that's... That's fine, that's fine, that's fine. It's not fine, but I don't feel like complaining about it anymore. Anyways, uh, Evan's programming went bad, and so Vosh wants uh, Ringer to capture him, bring him back, so that they can study him and figure out what exactly went wrong, and so they can see that they can prevent it from happening ever again. That kind of makes sense, I just wish they hadn't spent so long trying to get to that. So Ringer leaves Vosh and goes off to find them and says in her head, I want to kill Evan because, I, I don't know, it's just, it's just dumb. J don't question things anymore. And then it, uh, we have a brief epilogue where it cuts back to Cassie and them, and Evan is alive, he wasn't caught up in the explosion, and Cassie is super happy, and that's the end of book two. Now, book one started off as mediocre, but like, it could have been so much worse. It, it really could have been. Book two just went full filler. Like, this entire book barely anything happens. And I, I just really can't help but feel that this series was horribly, horribly mistreated when they made it into a trilogy. Because, like I've said, there are some good ideas here. Uh, and I think that had all of these just had most of the fat cut off and been combined into one long book, it wouldn't even be that long, really. It'd be 400, 500 pages if you really did it that way. Uh, and it would probably be better. But just having so much filler, and jumping around so much, and uh, having a climax in the second book, which isn't even really a climax, it's just Ringer escapes, and then she realizes, oh, okay, I don't want to escape, I'm just gonna leave, and go kill Evan. Like, it's not really built up towards, and it's not an impressive spectacle when it happens, it just, it just happens. So then we get to the final book, which is called The Last Star. Now, Man, this one... The second book dropped the ball and went from being mediocre to just straight up bad. This one goes from bad to... Yeah, it, it... I don't know. Literally the first sentence doesn't even make sense. Many years ago, when he was ten, her father had ridden a big yellow bus to the planetarium. That's supposed to say when she was ten. There's a typo in literally the first, the first goddamn sentence of this book. If you needed more proof that it was not properly edited, there it fucking is. So we have a prologue where we follow a nameless priest and some survivors in the cave. Uh, the, they talk some more about Hollywood atheism. It's, it's dumb. They talk around religion. Th this book series has like 18 different conversations where characters talk about religion, but they never really say anything profound about it. You know, like... I didn't particularly like uh, Mistborn's take on religion, like, mostly in the last book when Seized decides... Well, I don't want to spoil it, but I didn't particularly like that take, but at least it was a take on religion. This one doesn't even have anything other than a couple of characters going, oh, I don't believe in God because the world sucks. Like, if you're gonna talk about it, have something to say. Don't just use words to say nothing. My God. But anyways, the priest is a silencer, he's an alien. He kills a bunch of people, uh, he reveals in his inner monologue that the mothership has a bunch of bombs prepared, 
and they're gonna drop them on all the major population centers to kill any humans that might still be nearby. Which makes sense, you know, there's probably still uh, millions of people hiding out in big cities or near uh, big cities, not even big cities, but uh, they mention big and moderate sized cities. So basically anything over a couple thousand people is gonna get hit. And, you know, that makes sense. That's where most of the people probably are. And I guess it's supposed to be an ominous moment, but, well, it isn't. He also mentions that after the bombs drop, the fifth wave is supposed to be unleashed, which, wasn't it already released? Cool, whatever. Uh, so then we go back to Ringer. She's in the wilderness. She wants to meet up with the others so she can kill Evan. And, uh... One improvement I will say this book makes is that whenever it switches to a new character's POV, it puts their name on it, so you know right away that, okay, this is Ringer, this is Cassie, or this is Ben. And, you know, it's it's something that should have been there from the beginning, but, you know, whatever, just I'll, I'll take what I can get at this point. Now, uh, when Ringer runs into the others and they're talking with Cassie and all them, uh, Evan, uh, he believes, uh, well, he knows about the bombs being dropped, okay? And he believes that the mothership is going to send down some pods to get all the silencers and, you know, evacuate them up to the ship before the bombs drop. And so Evan is planning to hop on one of those pods when it comes, go back to the mothership, and then blow it up before the bombs can drop. Okay, that, that seems like a decent plan. And actually, uh, that could be an interesting plot uh, point later on. Like, that could be an, a good climax. At least that's what I was thinking at the time. I should mention that this has been several months since the last book. Like, Ringer's captivity was a long time, and then she escaped and was out in the woods for, like, 40 days, I think she says, uh, before she comes back to Vosh and he sends her out. So, uh, it's it's been a while. Winter is almost over, and it's been nearly a year since the uh, invasion first started at this point. Now, Ben wants to rescue Ringer and Teacup because he thinks they're uh, being held hostage, or being held prisoner. He doesn't know that Teacup is actually dead at this point, and I didn't bring that up because it's really not important. However, I will say that this little moment with Ben wanting to go back and get them is good because it's, it's his only bit of characterization is that he's not over uh, failing his younger sister. You know, he's not over the fact that she's dead and he was not able to protect her, and now he feels like all these kids under his command are his responsibility, so he needs to protect them. That That's like his one personality trait, but it's, it's something, and I do think it's good. I think that it could be the core of a really good uh, character. They just don't really spend enough time with Ben to do anything with it. So Ringer and Vosh plan to lure Evan to some caves uh, that the human kids were planning on going to after they left the hotel. Uh, there are some caves somewhere in uh, Ohio. I don't know if they're real or not, but, you know, they're, they're there. Ringer is planning on luring Evan there so that he can be captured, but luckily she's gonna, or, but she's planning on killing him instead so that Vosh can't uh, get the information he needs. We have a chapter following Sammy, where he's really edgy and thinking about, I want to kill all the aliens, I hate people, grr, and the plot doesn't progress at all. Um, ben and another uh, kid in the squad named Dumbo uh, leave to go to the caves, be to go to the caves that I mentioned, because they think Ringer might be there. And, man, this bit, like, could have been, it really could have been something, let me tell you. Like, it could have just been characters have to go off, and they uh, wind up in trouble on the way, and they just, <laughs> you could have done so much with it, but instead we get shit like this. You ever been to Urbana, Dumbo? I ask. He shakes his head. I'm from Pittsburgh. Really? I'd never asked. It was the unwritten rule in camp. Talking about our past was like handling hot coals. Well, go Steelers. Nah. He bites off a hunk of power bar and chews slowly. I was a Packers fan. I played some, you know. Quarterback? Wide receiver. My brother played baseball. Shortstop. Not you? I quit Little League when I was 10. How come? I sucked, but I kill at esports. Esports? You know, like COD. Competitive fishing? He shakes his head with a smile. No, Call of Duty, zombie. Oh, you're a gamer. I was borderline MLG. Oh, MLG, right. I don't have the first clue what he's talking about. Max level, prestige 12. Wow, really? 
I shake my head, thoroughly impressed, except I'm totally lost. You have no idea what I'm talking about. He crumples the wrapper in his fist. He glances around at the garbage littering every square of Urbana, then slips the wrapper into his pocket. There's something that's been bugging me, Sarge. That was an entire page! I hated that conversation so much. And basically their entire field trip is stuff like that. It's, it's nothingness. And there's huge parts of the first two books that are also like that, just nothingness. It's so overwritten. Like, like I said, one book. Could have been one book. You could have told the same story in one book, and it would have been a lot better. So anyways, uh, as they're going through the city, they notice a little red dot appears on Ben, and they're like, oh shit, it's a sniper. And so Dumbo dives in the way and gets shot by a sniper, and he survives, but um, I, he's very badly wounded, obviously. And I'm just wondering, why the fuck would a sniper have a laser dot anyways? Like, it's dumb when they do it in movies, too, because then people can see, oh shit, there's someone aiming at me. That defeats the whole purpose of being a sniper. Being a sniper is about being so far away and hidden that they can't shoot back at you, and most of the time they don't even know you're there until after they're already dead. Having a laser sight defeats the purpose. So anyways, Ben goes off and kills the silencer, who is an old woman, and then he patches up Dumbo as best he can, and he's like, well, I can't take him with me, I need to go get, I need to go to the cave so I can get Ringer, and so he's like, okay, kid, just hold on, and then he leaves. So then we cut back to Cassie, she's like super thirsty over Evan, and then she's insecure now because she knows he kind of dated Grace for a while, and she thinks Grace is prettier than her, presumably because Grace doesn't look 12 years old. Seriously, what the hell? Like, th this, this relationship starts with him stalking her, and then shooting her, and then uh, patching her up, bringing her to his house, making her dependent on him, and then it's later revealed she looks like such a kid. It's, it's, I'm very uncomfortable. So uh, Ringer is airdropped into the caves along with uh, another silencer. She meets the priest that was there. Uh, the priest beats her up for whatever reason. They, they really don't make this, they don't explain this. And then Ben runs into them and they manage to kill the priest and Ringer lies about escaping, and uh, the, the other silencer she's with is named Constance, and uh, Ben is like, this is kind of convenient that I happen to run into you, and you just happen to have this friend here named Constance, and Constance just cries, like fake cries, and says, oh, some horrible things happened to me, and then Ben just believes her because he's a dumbass, and anyways, they go to where Dumbo was back in Urbana, and uh, he's gone. They, they, they don't know where he went, and they manage to follow a trail, and then they find him, and then he, he somehow crawled ten blocks while, while he was shot, which is... Yeah, uh... Sure, sure, we'll, we'll say he can do that, we'll say he can do that. Uh, also, remember, he's twelve years old when this, when this happens, so... A twelve-year-old gets shot by a sniper, and then crawls ten blocks, and then he's still alive at the end of it, but anyways, they find him, and they talk to him a little bit, and he dies, and I'm just thinking, if you were just gonna have him die right away, then why not just have him? Then why not just have him still be at the spot where Ben left him, and then he dies? This is a waste of paper. So they go back to the others, and Constance uh, tries to kill Sam, but they fight her, and then they kill Constance. And I just feel like Ringer could have killed her earlier and saved everyone some trouble, but. Whatever, and then, anyways, Ringer tries to kill Evan, but then the aliens arrive, and they catch him and go away. Okay, that's, um... Yeah, that's fine. It, it doesn't really change all that much in the grand scheme of things. Like, so what if the aliens figure out uh, how the program went wrong with him? Like, they're still planning on dropping bombs, and him being gone doesn't really change anything. Especially because we learn at this point that they're not sending pods to save the silencers, so they won't have a way up there, they'll need to find a different way. It, this, this really doesn't have any sort of tension, it doesn't change the plot in any way, it just adds another obstacle for them to jump over. So then they get attacked by a, a wave of fifth wave, or a squad of fifth wave kids, and we get a chapter from their perspective, for some reason. I, I really don't know why they bothered with that, because it just makes things kind of confusing. 
Anyways, Ringer kills them, and then buries them, and buries herself as well. And uh, Ben actually threatens to shoot her at this point, because he's like, hey, you betrayed us, you brought Constance here, and then the others were able to find us and take Evan. Why shouldn't I kill you now? And she just says, because I'm pregnant. Which is just the cheapest, 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 easiest way to try and add artificial drama to a story like this. Like, just, just say, eh, someone's pregnant. And all of a sudden, everything's more dramatic. But the thing is that her being pregnant doesn't change anything for the rest of the story. Like, it, it makes Ben not shoot, shoot her okay, but the rest of the story, she's still able to do all the things that she did before, both physically and mentally, so, um... You know, alright, she's able to use those powers that were just given to her she didn't have to work for, so she's not an interesting character in any way. <sighs> okay, they, whatever, they argue about what to do for a little bit, and Cassie mentions that they're specifically bombing the cities because the cities hold human memories, which kind of makes sense in that, yeah, the cities have vast repositories of knowledge, like libraries and stuff, and if you destroy all that, then we're going to be set back significantly, but I'm, I'm pretty sure the main reason is that they're trying to kill people. You know, that, that's what they've been doing this whole time, Cassie. So they make a plan to hijack a, a helicopter and then go back to the base and rescue Evan. Now, I will say that after they've uh, come up with the plan, but before they actually put it into motion, there's a brief conversation between Cassie and Ben that I did like. I've had a crush on you since the third grade, I whisper. I wrote your name in notebooks. I drew hearts around it. I decorated it with flowers, mostly daisies. I had daydreams and dream dreams, and nobody else knew except my best friend, who is dead, like everybody else. Looking away, looking at nothing. But you were where you were, and I was where I was. You could have been in China for all it mattered. When you showed up out of nowhere at Sammy's camp, I thought it had to mean something, because you lived when you could have died, and I lived when I should have died, and we were both there for Sam, who also should have died. Just too many coincidences to just be a coincidence, you know? But that's all it is, a coincidence. There's no divine plan. There's nothing faded in our stars. No meant to be in any of it. We are accidental people occupying an accidental planet in an accidental universe. And that's okay. These seven billion billion atoms are good with that. So, basically she's saying that, like, yeah, life, there's no real point to it, but that's okay. Because life is still enjoyable. You know, we get to have friends, we get to love, we get to do stuff. And I genuinely liked that moment. You know, unlike all these parts where they're talking around religion and talking around the idea of God and around the idea of morality, this is something that actually says something. It's actually meaningful. So basically, they manage to call a helicopter in, and uh, Ringer and Cassie get on it, and they sort of hijack it and start moving uh, back to the base where Vosh and Evan are. And meanwhile, Ben takes Sammy and another kid named Megan, who... I haven't mentioned because she's not important, but she was the little girl that had the bomb in her throat that they removed. Anyways, he takes them back to the caves, which... Th there's a weird fixation on the caves in, in this, but, you know, whatever. And I do just want to give another plus in that they're actually building towards a climax here. Like, they're actually saying, like, hey, if we don't do anything, or if we don't get out of the way, we're going to be killed by all those bombs. And... Evan clearly wants to do something to stop the bombs in the first place, so... It, it's not a lot, but it's something. So they charge into the base, and then it cuts to Evan. Uh, he gets tortured with cold, which is... A, kind of a hardcore scene, I guess. In fact, I will say... I, I need to keep... I need to stop bringing this up, because it doesn't really mean much anymore when it happens this often, but... Basically, this series... Even though it's young adult, it does get pretty violent at times, and the characters do swear and stuff, so it doesn't feel too sanitized, it feels a little hardcore. And this scene where Evan is tortured, like he's stripped naked and sprayed with cold water and just put in a cold room for hours at a time, like, yeah, that's a pretty hardcore scene. He talks with Vosh a bunch, and Vosh like goes around and around and around and around and around and around in circles, and... This is when Vosh confirms that no pods are coming down to rescue the silencers. And he also confirms to Evan that there are no aliens, not only inside them, which Evan doesn't know. 
Like, he, he still thinks he's an alien at, that just sided with humans, but Vosh informs him about uh, the fact that they're just computer programs that think they're aliens. He also mentions there's no aliens on the mothership. It's like a big drone, basically, that they sent in. Which means this is an alien invasion story where humans never actually interact with the aliens in any way. They never talk to one, they never fight one. Oh my fucking god. And, and the thing is, part of the fun of uh, introducing new species or new race or anything like that is that we get to learn about that race. We get to learn about uh, their strange societal customs. We get to learn about how they fight. We get to learn about uh, their biology and stuff like that. And we get none of that here because we learn literally nothing about the aliens other than they want to destroy humanity in order to save it. So, when Evan got cut off from the mothership back in the last book, he also lost his powers, like his super strength and super speed and all that. Uh, Vosh gives him back his powers. Big, uh, Vosh, you are so stupid. Uh, but then he erases his memories, and it's confirmed that love is what broke the program, because I guess none of the other silencers ever fell in love because they never met Cassie, because Cassie is just that special. Men can only fall in love with her. It's not something that people do all the time. Cool. So Ben gets attacked at the caves by some soldiers, and he starts fighting them off. And they throw a bunch of gas in there, uh, like, or like smoke grenades, basically, to confuse your enemy. And Ben is again able to get out of trouble because one of them used a laser sight and he knows, oh, he's aiming at me and he jumps out of the way, but... Okay, in close quarters, a laser sight, sure, that, that can make sense, I can understand that, but if there's smoke going around, it's not gonna... Jesus Christ. Like, it's very clear that Ricky Yancey did next to no research about military matters or weaponry before he wrote this, and it's just very annoying, annoying. but... Yeah, anyways, so Ringer and Cassie, uh, Cassie is guided through the base, just like in book one, so she doesn't get to actually do anything. Ringer just tells her everything, and then she does that. Uh, they fight a bunch of soldiers, and Cassie doesn't have any agency, uh, but she manages to run to the command center, and then we find out Evan had his memories erased, and he's just evil now. He's like a totally robotic uh, follower of what he's supposed to do. Which raises the question, why, if, if you can make somebody who is just robotic like that, why didn't you just do that to all the silencers? You know, like, why, why would you give them a personality and make them think that they're alive? Why not just turn them into automatons that'll do whatever you tell them to? Now, in Evan's head, he starts thinking about how he no longer has empathy. Empathy is evil. Empathy is bad. And I'm just like, empathy is what created human civilization. Like, caring about other people and being willing to work together is what allowed us to do shit like this. That's what allowed us to get to the point where we can fucking write shitty books and... Uh, oh, I had that backwards. To write shitty books and then have other people read them and think that they're shitty and then complain about it on the internet and then get paid for that. Like, that all starts with empathy. Jesus Christ. So Ben is captured by the soldiers along with Sammy and Megan and he tells them about the bombing, and he's basically like, hey, uh, stay away from the cities and everything if you don't want to fucking die. And... Okay, cool. And at this point, it's switching back and forth very quickly. Like, we'll get a chapter that's like two paragraphs with one character, and then two paragraphs with another, and it just goes back and forth. And honestly, it's only switching to Ben in, in all this so that it feels like he's doing something. But even though he's doing action stuff, even though he's fighting off bad guys, he's not actually contributing to the story here. Like, Cassie and Ringer are the ones that are actually going to the base and trying to get Evan back and fighting the aliens directly. Ben is just kind of... Like, if he dies, then that's bad for him. And, you know, ideally, uh, we wouldn't want him to die because we care about him as a character, but plot-wise, it wouldn't, it wouldn't change anything. So Cassie finds out that Evan's memories are gone, and so she needs to find them again so that she can upload them back into him. And so... Okay, they can't 
find his memories just in the databanks and then upload it into Cassie, they, they just have no time to search for it. So she tells Winger to just put all, like, 10,000 people, put all their memories into my head. And, see, this is another thing that could have been cool, because uh, she does it, and then we get, like, a chapter of Cassie thinking about how, man, all these other identities are in here, I don't know where I stop and they begin anymore. And that's cool, that's very cool, but it comes in, like, the last 30 or 40 pages of this book, and it's... It's uh, so surrounded by so much other stuff happening that, well, we, we don't even get a chance to really experience this. Like, this is a neat idea. Like, someone having all these other people inside their head, or the memories of all these other people inside their head, and no longer being sure what your personality is and what came from others, that's a neat idea. And had they done it, like, at the end of book two, maybe, if they'd somehow put that in, and then we'd spent the entirety of the third book learning about that and seeing how it changes Cassie, then that could have been really cool. As it stands, it means nothing. So Ringer fights Evan, and Evan defeats her. But the thing is that Ringer and Evan have basically no relationship with one another, so this, uh, this doesn't really mean much. You know, you're not sitting there thinking, oh, I hope that neither of them really gets hurt. It's so sad to see these people who were once friends fighting, like, they have no relationship, so it doesn't... Okay, and then Evan uh, manages to break Ringer's back, which doesn't kill her, and he doesn't stop to finish her off for some reason. Again, whatever, not a... It's a problem, but not something I want to focus on anymore. And then he goes off to find Cassie, who uh, manages to electrocute him, uh, it doesn't kill him, but it does take him out of commission. Vosh shows up at Ringer, and he, like, gloats over her for a little bit, and then Cassie comes up and shoots him, and he dies, because he's a very pathetic villain at the end of the day. And then, uh, Cassie drags Ringer away, and then, or out of the immediate threat zone, and she manages to get something from Vosh that, uh, or his kill switch, excuse me, I forgot the word for a second. I'm not re-recording that, but she manages to get the kill switch from Vosh, and uh, while she's running away, she thinks about Sammy, and apparently his full name is Samuel Jackson Sullivan. Who this nigga on that name? You're on this council, but we do not grant you the rank of master. The oppression of the Sith will never return. Enough is enough! I have had it with these motherfucking snakes on this motherfucking plane! There are so many just dumb little moments in this, my god. Like, don't get me wrong, the plot as a whole is nonsensical and goes all over the place and doesn't amount to much, but, like, if you just pulled out those dumb little moments like that and stopped making everything happen at once, then this would be so much better. Yeah, Ben and company escape by jumping out of the helicopter and landing in a river, and then uh, Cassie uh, uses Vosh's kill switch to kill all the soldiers at the base, and then she manages to find his pod, because even though most of the silencers weren't going to get one, he had his own. And then she grabs a bomb, goes up to the mothership, and then while she's up there, the pod just automatically goes into like the docking bay where all the bombs are there, getting ready to drop. And then she blows up the bomb that she has, uh, killing herself, but also setting off all the others, and destroying the mothership, and freeing humanity from the aliens. And it happens all at once, is the thing. Like, this should be a cool moment. This should be triumphant. But it's just too easy. You know? Like, the things that were difficult were getting into the base. Like, actually destroying the ship was just... It, it was too easy. Like, they didn't have to sneak around on board. They didn't have to, like, infiltrate it. They didn't have to uh, find a specific spot on the ship while they were being chased or anything. Like, when I uh, was reading the beginning of this, and I... And Evan mentions that the bombs are going to destroy every major city. I was thinking, like, oh, okay, maybe something cool like that will happen. But no, we got nothing. We got absolutely jack shit nothing. And the thing is, Cassie has never really expressed a desire to save the world, is the thing. Like, if she had uh, been thinking about it before, like, what would I do to save humanity and prevent uh, people from dying then sure, that would, that would make sense that she'd be willing to sacrifice herself, but it just comes out of nowhere. 
because she's like the super special chosen one who must tragically give her life and then everyone will love her forever after that. Like, I, I, I'm not gonna call her a Mary Sue because she's really not. Hey guys, so something happened to the footage of this bit. It is now uh, like six hours later and I'm just, I don't know, I'm just gonna re-record this little part real quick. But like I was saying, Cassie is not a Mary Sue, but she does have a couple of Mary Sue elements because she's, she does screw up sometimes and not everybody likes her. And honestly, she's kind of a jerk at a few points, which is reasonable given, you know, the situation that she's in. Um, but she does have Sue elements to her and the fact that she saved the world and is basically the chosen one that must tragically give her life and everyone will love her forever after that is, well, that feels like something that a Mary Sue character would do. So then it cuts to a year later, uh, all the other survivors are in Marble Falls, Texas, which is a, an actual town, and Ben and Ringer are just in love now. You know, we don't, we didn't need to see their relationship get built up at all, and it really wasn't. Like, I mean, before this, I could buy that they were friends, or allies, comrades, whatever you want to call them that, but there was never any sort of romantic spark there. I mean, she seemed to like him, but that, that was about it. And uh, she also has a baby. Cool, whatever, that's not uncommon in epilogues. And Evan apparently uh, not only survived when Cassie electrocuted him, but somehow that gave him his memories back. I don't think that's explained in any way. Um, whatever. So yeah, Ben and them are all uh, hanging out in Texas now, and they're starting to rebuild things, like they have a little base where they're actually gardening and stuff. They're not just scavenging for food anymore. And Evan decides that he's gonna go off to kill other silencers. Like he's gonna, because even without the ship there, there's still a whole bunch of those guys running around killing folks. And Evan decides, you know what, I'm gonna protect people. I'm gonna go out and try and stop as many of those as I can. And so, he leaves in the middle of the night, which would be fine, but it just ends on such a sappy note. And, uh, yeah, I think that's about it. So, back to James with normal clothes on. Yeah, Ben, or not Ben, uh, Evan just goes off to try and help people, which is fine, but it ends on such a sappy note. You know, not even just him, but the, the series as a whole, the book as a whole. I'm just going to read the last couple lines to give you an idea of what I mean. But her throne's tilted down, Sam said, looking at the constellation. Won't she fall out? Zombie, uh, that's Ben's nickname, by the way. Zombie cleared his throat. She won't fall. Her throne is turned that way so that she can keep watch over her realm. What's a realm? Zombie pressed his hand against Sam's chest. This is Zombie's hand to Sam's heart. Here. And that is the last line. That is such a fucking sappy, just saccharine, sugary sweet line, which... Really, just like the beginning of the first book, where it tries to be all quippy and quirky and lighthearted, this is just too sappy, too nice, it doesn't fit with such a dark story. Because that's what this is. Okay, most of humanity is dead. That's a dark story. And the fact that it can't just stick with that and embrace it, <clears throat> just that is a pretty big failing. That's a pretty big part of how and why I was never able to get into this. So that was it. A thousand and ninety-five pages, all three books. Like, wait, you can stop a bullet with this. Ooh, yeah, nice. But yeah, like I said at the beginning, best example of uh, good ideas with bad execution that I can think of. Because just the idea of aliens coming, killing folks, and then people trying to survive, that that's a pretty cool idea. And some of the individual ideas, like the aliens, not wanting to kill all of humanity, you could do something with that. You know, you'd have to do something different than what the book did, but you could do something with that. And even at the beginning, uh, it starts off okay. Like that first part of the first book where Cassie is just, uh, she shoots the dude and then she's hiding under the car from the sniper, which turned out to be Evan, and then uh, she's flashing back and forth a bunch and it's just showing how the world got destroyed. That's okay, but then it lost focus. Because at the beginning of the first book, it's here's the world getting destroyed, and then after that, it's Cassie wants to go find her brother. That's pretty 
focused, pretty simple, and you can do a lot with that. But after she finds her brother, what's it about then? Like, it's not about saving the world, they don't specifically go out to plan that, it just kind of pops up in the third book, like Evan says, oh yeah, by the way, I have this plan to save the world. And then they don't follow that plan, but then at the very end, Cassie is just like, oh, I have an opportunity, and then she goes and blows herself up. So, it lost focus. And for that matter, it lost its protagonist after the first book, because the first one, uh, you could argue that there were two protagonists, and that's Ben and Cassie. I would really just say it was Cassie. Uh, it's even more so in the movie. One, we see all the destruction and everything through her eyes. You know, we see her experience with that. Uh, two, we start off with her and we end with her. And three, most of the important stuff she is there for. So, I would argue she's the protagonist, but then the second and third ones, it's like the author didn't know what protagonist, or what character he wanted to be the focus, so... It... Okay. Now, Cassie is nothing special, and she doesn't really do anything special, but she still winds up saving the day, which is just really lame. You know, like, I'm not saying she had to be some sort of ultra-mega badass that could kill a million aliens without even breaking a sweat, but she would have to have something about her... I'm sorry, it's like 90 fucking degrees in here. Um, excuse me. She would have to have something about her that allowed her to do extraordinary things. Otherwise, well, what's the point of having her as the protagonist? You know, protagonists should be extraordinary in at least one way. And Cassie doesn't do that. Now, the villains, which are mostly just uh, the others, and particularly Vosh, are some of the lamest villains ever. Like, at the beginning, you know, they destroy everything, but then after that, their plans are just nonsensical. And they're never properly explained, I don't think. Like, I was able to pick up that uh, what they were doing was trying to scatter humans into small little bands so they never build up a civilization again, but it's never put in that many words, I don't think. It might have been, I, I don't know, I, I don't feel like checking, but <laughs> anyways. And we never get a reason why they want to do this. Like, why do they want to do this? Did it, is it protecting the environment? I think it's protecting the environment, but why do they care so much? Is is our life-bearing planets just really rare? I... I don't know. They're, it's nonsensical, their plans are stupid, and so they never really feel that threatening. Uh, the characters, other than Cassie, have very little personality. Now, Cassie, I will grant her, she has multiple facets to her. She's not a great character, but... You know, we really do feel that uh, after she kills that innocent dude at the beginning, that she really wants to uh, protect innocent life. We know that she really loved her mom and dad, and she misses them. We know that uh, <clears throat> she really loves her brother and would do anything to protect him. And uh, she is kind of a jerk at the beginning, but again, that's totally reasonable, given all the shit she'd gone through by that point. Uh, the other characters... I mean, Ben has one real character trait, which is something, I guess. Evan is kind of a creepy stalker, so even though he's not an awful person for the most part, like, he's not super controlling of Cassie or anything, but he, he, I could never get into him because of that. And then, like, Ringer and Vosh and them, they just, there's very little to even talk about with them. There's just, there's just nothing there. Uh, the structure, as I've said several times, is awful. The twists are given away hundreds of pages before they should happen, and, uh, even though you had all these pieces for a great story, you didn't put them together properly, so it just falls apart. Uh, there's no escalation, and there's no really big moments. Yeah, you ever notice that? Like, there's no uh, point where it's like, okay, here we're fighting aliens in this battle, and then not long after that, oh, there's a bigger battle, and then a bigger and bigger, and then, you know, it builds up until you get to this point where you're uh, about to go destroy the mothership to save the world. And I'm not saying it had to be a traditional just uh, go out and kill the bad guys story. Like, you could have done more with it, and frankly, you should. You shouldn't just have nothing but fighting throughout. But, like, there's no escalation at all. It, it's just, we fight some bad guys, we escape, maybe we lose some people. We fight some bad guys, escape, maybe some people die. We fight bad guys, escape. We go after bad guys, we fight bad guys, we escape. Like, there's no sense of escalation at all. And... Because of that, there's no really big moments. Uh, there's no big shocking twists, because I I've already mentioned that plenty of times, you don't need me talking about it more. 
But even beyond that, there's just there's just no big story beats that really grabbed me. Uh, the villain, pathetic, just uh, talks around uh, exposition, like I said. Uh, this could have been one book which was just focused on Cassie, because, uh, like I said, if it was just third person, we wouldn't have that issue with switching back and forth all the time, and uh, if it was just focused on Cassie, we'd be focused on the best character, and if it was just one decently long book, it would cut out most of the fat and the filler, and we could still do something uh, interesting with it. Like, imagine if Cassie rescued uh, Sam and met up with Ben at, like, the halfway point. You know, and then from there on, it's like, okay, the aliens are gonna drop bombs, let's find a way to stop that. You know, that that could have been something. That could have been something really cool. And plus, if, uh, just, like I mentioned before, if just the audience and Cassie knew that uh, the soldiers were aliens, and we knew that Ben was with them, we could show, like, little, uh, quick clips from them, and we, and they would just be going along with everything, thinking, yeah, let's, we'll fight for these guys but we would know, oh shit, something's gonna go bad soon. And so that would have some tension. And, uh, like I said, keep it in one POV. And if you fix all of these issues, I think it would have been okay or good. I don't think it would have been great, because there's just so much nonsense here, and so many plot uh, elements that make no sense, and there's so many wasted opportunities that I don't think you could make this great without doing some pretty serious rewrites. All of that said, I can see how someone else would enjoy these books. Like, I can totally see how you can look at the issues and just shrug it off and say, yeah, I, I get it, that's kind of stupid, but not a big deal to me. I, I totally get that. And I never, I'm never putting down anyone's tastes uh, when I'm reviewing in this kind of detail, you know? Even if I'm saying something's really bad, like, that's my opinion, you know, you're allowed to have your own. You're allowed to like stuff, even if I don't. Uh, but, yeah, I can see why someone would like the Fifth Wave trilogy. I, I totally can. Unlike something like Throne of Glass, where there's just... This story has been done a million times, and it's been done better a million times, and this doesn't really add anything new to the formula, so I'm not sure how that one got popular. And it's not like House of Night, where there's just nothing redeemable there at all, and I'm not sure why people were even into it. This one, I totally get why people enjoyed it. And at the end of the day, I'm not angry, I'm just disappointed. So, where would this fit in my top 10 worst books? Honestly, I would need to think about it a lot more, because I've been thinking about it for several days, ever since I finished these, but I just, uh, for the life of me, I cannot come up with a concrete answer that I stick with for more than a few minutes. So maybe it would not be on the list at all. Like, it would be close to being on the list, but it wouldn't be on there. And maybe it would just be low on the list. Like, it might be in 10th or 9th place. I, I don't know. But what I will say is it, it's nowhere near as bad as some of the other stuff I've talked about in this segment. Where I just review terrible, shitty young adult books. Like, it's not pure, unbridled insanity like House of Night. It's not uh, semi-bridled insanity with a bunch of cringy lines the way uh, Elixir was. It doesn't turn into porn halfway through like Throne of Glass was. There's really nothing offensive in here. There's nothing that made me angry. It's just, yeah, it's, it's really bad and nonsensical. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not angry, I'm just disappointed. Now, at the end of my House of Night review, I already told you what my next big review would be. My next really shitty young adult series would be. And much like The Fifth Wave, this one also had a terrible movie adaptation, which came out in 2016. It's not as well known, though. Fallen. Yeah, it, I don't know if you can see, but this is Fallen. Thanks a bunch for watching, especially to my patrons, without whom I couldn't do these long, long videos. Uh, my $10 and up guys are Apo Savalainen, Ashley Watson, Ava Toomer, <laughs> Brother Santodes, Cavity Sanity, Christopher Quinten, Emily Miller, Joel, Johnny St. Clair, Madison Lewis Bennett, Taylor Briggs, Tobacco Crow, and Ve Victus. And all the other names here, you guys are, you guys are awesome. Please stay tuned for my next one, and I'll see you then. Bye.